All right. We are going to talk a little bit about, oops, announcements this morning. So pay attention over the next couple of weeks to our website or our app or our texting system or our Facebook page. Anybody know what this Thursday night is? Chewing the Cud with Rabbi Peyton, 6.30 here at the barn, continuing in Genesis. I'm going to teach on a little bit on Genesis today, but it'll be radically different than how Peyton's teaching it. Then remember, we have no church next Sunday, okay? No church next Sunday the 3rd, okay? But we have our new church, Truth and Love Church, that's going to start coming here and meeting on Sunday nights. Their first Sunday is next Sunday. If you want to come to their service, it's going to be at 6 p.m., I believe, next Sunday night. We are not having service. They are. Okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Monica. There's a dinner. See, Monica came to us from that church, so see, it's okay to let people intermingle within congregations. I know you don't see that in the South, in the Bible Belt, but it's about the bigger flock, right, and the bigger church. Um, so Monica has a good point. They're going to have a potluck at 5 p.m. and then service at 6 or 6.30, something like that. But I think they're kind of like us from the one time we went. It's ish. It's ish. <laughs> it's even ish on the ending time. All right, so next, so Chew in the Cud, Thursday, no church next Sunday. The new church starting here Sunday night. So pray for us. This is a new thing for us. We got to have balance. So pray for us in that, okay? Then Thursday, December 7th. So we got a Thursday night service, no Sunday. Then another Thursday night service. So Thursday, December 7th is our first Hanukkah service. And then the second Hanukkah service is on Sunday, December 10th. Now I know that some of y'all don't like to come to midweek services. I'm going to ask you to come. If Peyton has taken the time to prepare to teach you about what Hanukkah is and the importance of it, please show up for the first one so that you understand more what the second one is about, okay? They build on each other. All right. Everybody good on that? So our calendar is posted. It's updated. Go check it out if you can't remember, but just keep an eye on it because if you show up next Sunday morning, I'm going to be asleep while y'all think we're going to be worshiping. Probably not, but anyway. Giving scripture today, Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. The best part. The best part of everything you produce. Then, see there's an if then. You do your part, you give to God, then God will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. This was literal for them back then. That's what they needed to survive every day. For us, some of us wonder why we can't get ahead in life. We can't, why we can't get ahead of our bills. Well, maybe it's because we're not giving, honoring God with the best part and allowing him to come test that and fill our vats or honor that. I'm sorry. So we have many ways to give. Our giving box in the back, you can put cash or checks. If you do cash, please fill out the envelope so we know who it is so we can give you your tax credit. Checks can be made to follow him with us. You can give on our website and our app or on Venmo. Now, I want to tell you something. Do you guys remember at the end of the sermon last week, while I was praying, I mentioned a man in Phoenix that got shot for preaching. Anybody remember that? Or at least three that were still awake at the end of the sermon. That's awesome. He was a pastor. He was a pastor that was standing on a street corner trying to get people to come into his church for a service in, in the evening. Somebody walked up and shot him in the head. Okay. I ask you to pray for him. That is him. He is a veteran who fought in wars for our country and then comes home to his safe country to get shot for preaching the gospel. He has not only one kid, but two kids. I think she's pregnant there in that picture. And the reason I'm bringing this up is we want to continue to pray for him. But you gave money to them this week. He is alive. He is recovering. He is not out of the woods. He's still in critical care. He could die, but I think prayer is keeping him awake, and guess what? They're going to have a lot of medical bills. And I don't know if you know this, but a man coming out of service working for a church doesn't make anything. I work for two churches. I know this. 
So you gave to help their medical expenses this week. So I want you to know, a lot of your money that comes into this place goes back out to other needs. And that's why we need you guys to give. We have bills to pay, yes, a lot of them. I'm talking about the church. But at the same time, we're trying to invest out into other things like Crystal's ministry, things like this. Because what if one day we're being persecuted and we need his church praying for us and sending us a little bit of money to care for medical bills? That's what the whole church should be about, okay? So I just want you to know as you give, it's not going into Wendy and Jason's pocket. It is some going into this building and keeping it running, yes. But it's going out to the community and out to the United States, out to the world. All right? Father, thank you for the opportunity that we can give to you, that we can honor you, and that you do fulfill your promise to give us what we need. So, Father, I'm thankful for that. Thank you for the Israeli soldiers that are putting you first out on the battlefield. Father, we pray for them, for their safety. Father, I thank you for the hostages that are being released. I pray for the protection of the hostages that are still being held. I pray for their release, Lord. We pray for more Muslim people to come to know your son through dreams, Lord. Oh, it's so wonderful, Lord. They can't deny the dream when Jesus shows up. Maybe some of us need Jesus to show up in a dream. Father, I thank you for a pastor, for Hans Schmidt, who was bold enough to stand out on a street corner and preach the gospel and invite people to come in to receive your son. So, Father, we pray for a miraculous healing over his head. He was shot in the head. We pray that there's no long-standing effects, that you completely heal his brain in Jesus' name. And now he stands on the street corner bragging as a testimony about your healing power. And, Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we can come alongside somebody we don't know and let them know that we're praying for them and that we can give financially to them in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Today, we're going to start something that we're not going to finish for a couple of weeks. Dang. Who said that? <laughs> Thanks, Eli. Eli. Eli made a sarcastic remark that we'll finish in years. Well, maybe by then. Never mind. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I thought I was going to do this one week sermon. And I prayed, and I started putting it together, and I don't know if any of y'all have done this, but if you have, maybe you're going to teach something, maybe you're going to talk about something, and you pray, and you have an idea of where you're going. You have scriptures, the whole nine yards, and then an hour of talking later, you realize there's nothing in here that was in those original thoughts. And so we're going to have an abrupt landing of the plane today, to use an old analogy. We're going to have that plane kind of coming in. It's going to be a touch and go, and then I'm going to make you wait for three weeks to hear the sequel, okay? This is like watching your favorite movie, and at the end, they leave you with a cliffhanger, and you know there's a sequel coming, and then you got to wait like a year. Well, you only got to wait three weeks, okay? So we're going to start out talking a little bit about authority, and you have a little handout because we're going to go through a lot of Scripture today. But it's going to be to build. So if you just take this scripture on your handout and you just start reading it, it's probably not going to make a lot of sense. You're going to be like, man, you are from Genesis 1 to Revelation 16 to Exodus 7 to Acts 16. Like we're schizophrenically all over the Bible today. <laughs> but I'm going to try to tie it together in something that makes sense today that kind of whets your appetite for three weeks from now. I'm going to start out with the word authority. What is the first thing that comes to mind for you when I say authority? Somebody said power. Convenient that you had that on your paper. Leadership. I heard leadership. What's that? Position. Also convenient on your paper. What do you think? The right to do something? Good. Thank you. 
But when you hear the word authority, do you immediately think about what does that mean? Or do you think about who has authority over you? Like government authority, police authority, family authority, boss authority, God authority? Do you think about who you have authority over? Uh, Here's a good question. When you hear the word authority, do you instantly feel like rebelling? Thank you for being honest. See, some people, whoa, I got way more of a response out of that one. (laughs) See, authority is one of those words that when you say it or hear it, it can instantly spark an emotion in you. So here's why I want you to be careful. When I say authority 4,700 times today, don't let it spark or trigger you, okay? Tune in for where the message is trying to go and what God is trying to show us about true authority versus maybe fake authority, okay? We hear the word authority and we immediately, immediately start forming thoughts about where a person is going with a discussion. Now, as the leader of a church, I can use the word authority. And immediately you might think, what has he done wrong? What have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? If I say, I am in authority over you, Jennifer would say, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? Right? And sometimes leaders exert authority in a controlling way that creates that thought, right? Right? So you might think, what have I done wrong? Or, oh, no, this guy's going to try to control me or something he doesn't like or whatever. But I think more often than not, and I'm included, when I hear the word authority, a lot of times I just go into a rebellious state. Like, you're going to have to prove to me that you deserve to have authority over me before I follow what you say, right? So sometimes it's easy to submit to authority, but oftentimes it's not easy. And if you're the one in authority, sometimes it's easy to lead correctly with that authority, but oftentimes it's not easy to lead correctly with authority, and you abuse your authority over the people and incorrectly use your authority to control them, right? Thank you. So in my opinion, in our world today, authority is an abused word. It's an abused thing, position, title. And it's often used as a way to control people. And I'm throwing all this out to create this tension because i got to get you to shelve that during our discussion today. Because we're going to look at what authority actually means for the world and what it means for biblical authority and how they're separate. We feel all these thoughts or connotations when we hear the word authority. Connotation means as soon as I hear something, it evokes a thought, an emotion, a memory. So when I say someone is in authority over you, you get this negative connotation, but maybe we need to separate that from what true biblical authority is to understand what biblical authority is so we won't be rebellious to it. So let's start out with a worldly definition. Let's tackle that first. We're going to separate what the world calls authority from what is biblical authority. Webster's Dictionary, if that thing is still a thing today, (laughs) it is online. (laughs) I don't know if they make the book anymore. Authority is the power, the power, the power. Somebody said power. It's on your sheet. The power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior. So someone has the power over what you think. They have the power over what you do. They have the power over how you perceive things. It also can be freedom granted by one in authority. Like I give you the authority. I gave Philip the authority to come up here. I have authority. I gave Philip authority to come up here and do communion. I gave him the freedom, the right. I didn't stand up here and control what he said. I took a risk. He could get up here and talk for an hour. We're going to make fun of people today. Let's get it all out. So it can either be, yes, I'm very thankful. I'm getting Philip back because I got a text on Monday that said, you'll be on the the radio tomorrow at 7 a.m. There was no choice. So I repaid him with no choice today on the spot. Anyway, worldly authority is the power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior, or it's a freedom granted, or it's a person or persons in command. 
And the dictionary says specifically a government. So we think about the government authority. Okay? So everybody got that? I put it on your paper very simply. Authority from a worldly perspective usually means power and or position. There is a key word we're about to go into with biblical authority that changes the definition from worldly authority. So if we look at the biblical definition of the word authority or power, in the New Testament we see a Greek word called exousia. Everybody say it with me, exousia. You guys did great. It means to have the power and the right. Okay? Did you pick up on that second word? The right. It's on your paper. Worldly authority, and I hope I get all this right. If y'all hear me say something that doesn't sound right, just stop me so I can re-say it because I'm saying authority a lot. Worldly authority says there's power, and it's often associated with a position. Biblical authority is different. It is power, but it's also associated with the right. There has to be a right, and we're going to get into that. They look a little differently. Worldly authority often comes with a title, power only. Biblical authority comes with power and the right. It can come with a, with a title as well, but it has a right. I'll give you a few examples because I think examples help us understand the difference. I or you may have very, very little worldly authority. Who in here has an incredible worldly authority? No, you don't. Parker raised his hand. No, you don't. You don't have any authority in your household. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. He does. He, have all, he has a lot of uh, his biblical authority. He has the right. But I may have very little worldly authority, but I can have an incredible biblical authority. And that's why this is important to realize. Oftentimes we think, man, I have no authority in the world. I have no position. I have no platform. But do not confuse that with biblical authority and think you don't have something. You have incredible. I have incredible biblical authority if we take it. But if we don't separate those two, we'll never understand the power that we're designed by God to carry, the biblical power, the biblical right, the biblical authority that we have. So I'm going to give you an example. Anybody want to talk about our president today? All right. We're going to talk about our president. Everybody said no. And I don't talk a lot about politics, but I'm going to use this example as a fact. This is a fact. This is not an opinion. It's a fact. It's a fact to separate between biblical and worldly authority. Our president has power over me. Our president has power over each of you, right? No one in the United States will dispute. Well, there's a few that will hold up the Constitution in front of you, but even that doesn't work. The president of the United States has power over each of us, okay? Now, we're not talking about his mental abilities today. We're just talking about his power by title. I know I said I wasn't going to go political, but I had to throw one thing in there. We're not going to talk about how evil he is. We're just going to talk about his power and authority. He has the title of the most powerful man in the world. And with that title, he carries power. He carries authority over us. So from a worldly perspective, he has authority over me. He can have me arrested tomorrow with no reason. He can... Let me for go free. Pardon me. Just like he did a turkey this week. Right? He has worldly power. But let's see where it changes to biblical. If he comes to me and he tells me that a baby in the womb at conception is not a life, he has no authority over me. Because it just switched from worldly to biblical. If he tells me that a baby in a womb is not a human life until birth, he just changed the authority to something he doesn't have because he has no right. Do you understand the difference? He has power over me because he's the most powerful man in the world. But he doesn't have the right to influence what the Bible tells me. Does that make sense for you guys? Are you following me? Luke one forty one. It tells us that the sound of Mary's greeting. This one I think I forgot to put on your list. Luke 141, it says, at the sound of Mary's greeting. So Mary 
had had the angel show up and say, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. You're going to call him Yeshua. Mary goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house, and Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's my go-to scripture. John the Baptist was a human that literally felt the presence of Jesus when Mary walked in the room. So because of that, the President of the United States has power over me, but he doesn't have the right to change my mind about something that's biblical. Okay? He doesn't have the right to change my belief on the value of human life from conception. I'm just using one that's big in the world right now. Because he would tell you he has the right to define that. He has the power to define it. He does not have the right to define it. He has authority over me. He has power. He has worldly authority. But he does not have biblical authority, which is power combined with the right, to make me believe that his unbiblical thoughts and ideas are what I should believe in or act on. And I could give you a thousand examples. Does this make sense to you guys? Are you following me? Because if you're not, I want to stop. And give you your marker back. All right. See, Satan has power. And I don't think we're taught this very often, but we need to understand the power that he holds to understand if it's worldly and or biblical. And I'm going to give you some scripture here in a minute that proves that Satan has power. He has power on this earth, worldly power, worldly authority. But the question is, does he have the right? Does he have the right? And the answer is yes and no. And this is what we're not taught, I don't think, often enough. He has worldly authority. I'm going to give you scripture to show that. But out of the get-go, he doesn't have biblical authority unless we give it to him. That's the yes and the no. He doesn't come to earth and have biblical authority over me, even though he has power, unless, ah, I give it to him. So we're going to talk about defining what authority is today and going through Scripture. And then next time, we're going to talk about practical application because I'm a little bit concerned that many of you go, yeah, you're right. I don't give Satan the right, and we give Satan the right all day, every day. And that's the problem. He does not have the power and the right unless we give him the right. We're going to talk about how he got the power in a minute. And I'm not going to give you opinion. We're going scripture on all this. But we often give him the right, and we don't even realize it. And then we just say, well, I guess on this earth he just has authority over us. Or we might say he doesn't have authority over us when we have given him the right, and he does have authority over us. It gets confusing. It gets very gray. But Satan has worldly power, but he does not have biblical power, biblical authority, unless we give it to him, unless we allow it. So we're going to dig dip deeper into this scripturally, but I want to make sure that we understand the difference between worldly authority and power and biblical authority and power. You have very little worldly authority. I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, step on your toes, but you have incredible, you have incredible biblical authority. Incredible. If you don't give it away if you understand what it means and what is available to you. And that's going to be the fun part. When we talk about the practical application and then what power is available to you, that's the fun part that I can't wait to get to in a couple of weeks. So let's dig into biblical authority a little bit more. We're going to kind of quit talking about worldly authority and, unless it compares. Genesis 1.1, I think that's the first scripture on your thing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So how did our Father in heaven create everything you see? Spoke it. Peyton would say he sang it. That's, that's good because we're going to talk about our voices next time. But I'm going to go a little bit more simply. He created all of creation that we see because he has the power to create it and he has the right. It's his power and it's his right. He has the authority to do what he wants, create what he wants, destroy what he wants, Right? And he has the ultimate authority over heaven and over earth. Does everybody get that? This is our baseline. Our Father, our Creator, 
Elohim has the ultimate authority on heaven and on earth. He ain't given up that heavenly authority, but he may give up a little worldly authority in the right circumstance. But we need to understand that's our baseline. If you don't believe that the Creator has the power and the right to do what He wants, when He wants, how He wants, to destroy what He wants, when He wants, how He wants, and it doesn't really matter if we understand it or not. If we don't have that as our baseline, we can't move forward in this discussion. It's our starting point to understand biblical authority. And as a little bit of a side note, I think this is why a lot of people don't want to believe in God. Because they don't want to submit to earthly authority because earthly authority often puts unfair control over people and hurts people for their own personal gain. So if an earthly authority has hurt me, it's harder for me to submit to a heavenly authority. And we get the two confused. And I think a lot of people, it's not that they don't believe in God. It's they don't want to submit to a creator because they don't understand the difference between worldly and biblical authority. If I can't submit to an earthly authority, I'm rebellious, then how am I going to submit to biblical authority and not be rebellious? So that's why it's very important to understand and separate these two. Worldly authority is often abused. You can think of hundreds of examples of worldly authority being abused. God's ultimate biblical authority is, has, never, will be abused. Never will be, has never been, is not abused. Worldly authority is often abused. God's ultimate biblical authority is never abused. Okay, so God in his power and his right, he creates the world we know. He creates everything in it and he creates man. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign. Reign sounds like he's giving power, right? And the right. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. They will reign. That means God created them and gave them, Adam and Eve, power and the right. Verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. That sounds like power and the right. Reign, there's that power and right word again, reign. He gives them the power and the right. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Okay, so we got this God, Elohim. He is the most powerful. He has the power and the right in all of heaven and earth, and he creates humans. First of all, he creates earth, and he creates fish and animals and all that stuff. Then he creates humans, and he transfers some power to them. He gives them the power and the right to rule over things in the earth. Okay? Everybody still with me? So let's start there. Our Father in heaven has all authority for heaven and earth, but in his original design, he gives some of his authority, the power and the right, to humans to rule the earth. We're told in the first book of the Bible. We as humans were created to rule and reign. We were created by the Creator to have biblical authority over all the earth. If you go out to the African jungles right now and you see a lion, do you have authority over that lion? From a worldly perspective, you probably just became lunch. But Adam and Eve walked over and petted the big kitty cat because they reigned over it. They owned it. They had the power and the right given by God. And to me, that's exciting. I just hope you're getting this. God made us as humans to share his authority. He did not create us to share his authority in heaven right off the bat. He created us to share his authority on the earth. And he gave us the power and the right to do it. But then what happened? God gave the humans free will. And we as humans don't do so good with free will because we're selfish beings. And see, God had to give us free will. If he didn't give us free will and he creates Adam and Eve, he's not really giving up his power and authority to them. He just creates robots, right? He has to give us free will. Somebody would say, why would God allow evil? Because he has to allow free will. And when you allow free will, you're allowing someone to choose good or evil. He had to allow it or we're just robots. 
To me, it's exciting that God created humans in the original design to have power, authority, the right over the earth. But then they got free will, they screwed everything up, and they only had one rule. You have more rules to follow at your job. When you get out on the road and drive home today, you have more rules to follow than Adam and Eve had. They had one rule, one law, one thing. They had complete authority except for one thing. Genesis 2, 6, but the Lord God warned them, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So God has all authority, gives Adam and Eve the power, the right to rule the earth if, if they follow one rule. And let's be honest, he didn't make that rule that hard. I give you power, and I give you the right if you just don't eat from this one tree. But if you eat from this tree, you willingly give up the power. You give up your right. And then i got to create a bunch more rules that you're going to complain about for the rest of eternity. So what happens in Genesis 3? The serpent comes along, Satan, the devil. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. This is Genesis 3, 1. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? I've talked about this before. All Satan did was show up and create doubt. That's all he did. Because Satan knew that Eve had the right at this point. Satan had no authority over Eve. No authority over Adam. But what he can do is he can lie to him and try to mislead him a little bit. And I've talked about this before. Eve gets a little bit defensive. Verse 2, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that you are not, that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Verse 4, you won't die. Come on. You're not going to die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. What did Satan do? You have power. You have the right. But there's more power. You just eat that fruit and you get more power. He just tempted them with more than what they already had. Yeah, it was a lie, Jacob. That's good. It was a lie, but it was a lie about getting more power. So we have this built-in thing as a human that we think we deserve more power than we get. Greedy, 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 Parker said. God, verse 5, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. You will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked, fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, the weak, passive Adam that stood by and let it happen. I added that paraphrase in there. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened. Maybe you should say, at that moment, they gave up their power and their right. See, God had given them all the power and all the right over earth. And in one moment of eating that fruit, breaking that one rule, they willingly gave up the power. Satan didn't come and kill them to get the power. He didn't steal the power from them. Yeah, I guess you could say he stole it by convincing them of a lie. But he talked them into willingly handing it to them. We willingly hand over our right sometimes and then complain because we don't have the right. I'm just so scared of what could happen. You just handed the right to Satan to enter you with fear. Just a little taste on where we're going to go in three weeks. Scripture, on the other hand, says you do not have a spirit of fear. So if I stand on that biblical authority, Satan has no right. But if I say I'm just scared all the time and I'm so afraid. You just opened the door and gave him the right. And that's what Eve did. Adam and Eve both, they gave him the right. They gave their power and their authority to him when they did that. He offered them fake power. See, the truth was when you eat that fruit, you just now know good and evil. It didn't give them more power. It actually stole away from them. It was fake power. Remember that term, fake power. 
They made the decision, though. So, see, sometimes we've talked about this before. We blame Satan for a lot of things that we willingly walk into. Well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't make you do it. He may have lied to you, but you willingly did it. I've said it before, but I quit saying that. I can say the devil tempted me, but it's up to me to do something. All right, I'm going off off a little bit here. That's that's next week, two weeks, three weeks, whenever. They had to be the ones that act. They were the ones that gave up their power, their right, their authority. So we started off with our baseline that God has all authority, heaven and earth. Then he gives authority, biblical authority, power and right to Adam and Eve for the earth. Gives them one rule. Satan convinced them to willingly break the rule. They transfer their power and their right to Satan. Now, I said earlier, Satan has power, but he doesn't have the right unless we give it to him. This is where we saw Peyton, um, Peyton, sorry, buddy. This is where we saw Satan get the power. Satan and power turned into Peyton. I'm sorry, buddy. Forgive me, son. The devil made me do it. (laughs) Just kidding. He has no authority. (laughs) Satan has power, but he doesn't have the right unless we give it to him. And I'm going to give you three biblical examples of where we see Satan's power because I've had people argue with me all the time. People either agree that Satan has the power and they don't think we have any authority over him or they go to the other extreme, here we are with extremes again, and say Satan has no authority. Well, I got biblical proof he does. Exodus 7, verse 10, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, did what the Lord had commanded them, Aaron threw down a staff before Pharaoh and his officials. It became a serpent. So Aaron's got a staff, piece of wood, throws it down. It becomes a snake. That's power. God gave them the power and authority to let that thing turn into a snake to show his power. Okay? Ah, verse 11. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. This is that fake power. Satan had power to do the same thing that Aaron did and Moses did. Ah, but what's the next end of that verse? But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. There's a whole story in here. God has the ultimate power. Satan has power. He can mimic a lot of what God's going to do, but who has the ultimate authority? It's shown right there. God's power ate Satan's power, literally. So God has the power. He has the right. He gave that power and right to Moses and Aaron. They were obedient. They did what they were asked to do. Satan also has power, but he didn't have the right in this instance. So God's power wins. Aaron's staff swallows up their staffs. The point there is Satan has power, but in this instance, he does not have authority over what God has given authority to. God gave authority to Aaron and Moses, and Satan's power didn't go over their authority. Does that make sense? Another example. Let's get out of the Old Testament, go to the New Testament. Acts 16, remember there was this girl. She told fortune. She made her her masters a lot of money. Acts 16, verse 16, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Remember, we talked about this in Acts. She's playing the game like she's on their side when she's not. Verse 18, this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to her, to the demon, he said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. See, Satan had power. He gave that power through an evil spirit to this little girl. But Paul had a greater authority. He had the power and the right given by God to cast that evil spirit out of the girl. You get it? Satan has power. But Paul, through his obedience, had a greater power, a greater authority. I can give you a lot of other examples. Oh, the Antichrist, he comes on the scene in Revelation, suffers a fatal wound. That means death. Then Satan gives power to the false prophet to heal the Antichrist. Revelation 13 Verse 3, I saw one of the heads of the beast, the beast is the Antichrist, seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. 
The whole world marveled. The whole world saw this. The whole world marveled, or will see this, marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the Antichrist, the beast. They worshiped the dragon, that's Satan, for giving the beast such power, and they also worship the beast. So Satan, clear, black and white, gives the Antichrist power after he heals the Antichrist. Just a few verses later, the false prophet comes on the scene. He's doing miracles. So I'm giving you examples from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible where Satan clearly has earthly power. We went from one end of the Bible to the other. But just because he has power, what does he not always have? The right. I need you to get that in your head. He has power, but not always the right. Therefore, he doesn't have full authority. It's a fake, false authority. He shows up making you think he has authority because he has power, but he doesn't have the right unless we give it to him. But God, when he gives us power and authority, it's always greater than Satan's fake authority. Always greater. So we're told in Scripture that Satan's goal is what? Steal, kill, destroy. What does he do? He offers us a power. That power seems like it's going to be good for us. It's going to give us something. It's going to give us a good result. But what does his power ultimately do in every case? Destroys. Every case. Every one of those I just gave you. What happened to the Egyptian musicians? Egyptian magicians. <laughs> Probably in the musicians. They got destroyed. What happened to the little girl? She lost her power. See, everything is designed by Satan to look good. Adam and Eve, it looks good because you're going to know good and evil, and then knowing good and evil destroyed them, literally. They would have never died if they hadn't eaten from that tree. It's a false, fake authority. It ends in destruction if it's from Satan, from Adam all the way to the Antichrist, because the Antichrist gets healed from a fatal wound, and that looks like great power. But then Jesus comes, defeats the Antichrist. Even the Antichrist is destroyed. Satan's destroyed. Everything in between. False, fake authority. Now, last week, we talked about the importance of believing the Word of God to be literal in creation. We are not on a billions-of-year-old earth. We are on a 5,784-year-old earth, if I got the year right. It's literal, and we talked about Revelation being literal. It's important because if we think both of these are figurative, then we're going to just think that everything I just gave you about establishing a fake authority is also figurative. Well, it's just figurative. God still has all the authority. No, Satan has literal authority. That's why we need to understand this is literal. And he doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want you to see that. He doesn't want you to believe the Word of God where he's exposed. If the creation story is not real, then you don't have the transfer of authority to humans. If revelation isn't real, then you don't have the reclaiming of the ultimate authority by Jesus. Do you get that? All right. So, how is our authority that Adam willingly gave up restored? I hear somebody whispering it. Through the Messiah, through Jesus, through Yeshua. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45-49, the Scriptures tell us, this is Paul talking. The first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Verse 47, Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. Okay. So God creates the earthly man, Adam. Adam is given all authority, power and right. He gives it up. But then Jesus comes as what's described here as the second Adam. Or the last Adam is what some people would call it. To redeem what the first Adam gave up. It says that Adam, the first man, was made from the earth, but Christ, the second man, man came from heaven. The second Adam has a different authority he came with. The first Adam only had the authority given to him 
that he gave up. Then Jesus comes on the scene, and he's got a different authority. He's got a heaven authority. But here's the thing. Jesus comes from heaven, all authority from the Father, all the power, all the right, full authority from God, but he's physically made a man, and he has to endure the same temptation that Adam was given, the same temptation to give up his authority. Did you ever pay attention that Adam and Eve failed on the first try? They didn't even make it through the first try. He made one try, and they failed. One try. But Jesus went through three tries and didn't fail. And we're going to dig into that because I think there's some huge importance that I've never heard preached before. I'm not saying it hasn't been. Go to Luke 4. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil, so the devil waited till he was weak, till he was broken down, desperate for food. And the devil comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. Satan hit him in his weakness. You're hungry. You're the son of God. You got power, right? Turn that into a loaf of bread. Verse 4, but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Temptation number one, hey, show me your power, Jesus. Satan knew he had power. Satan's just trying to get him, he's just trying to lure Jesus like he lured Eve. But Jesus wasn't just an easy target like Eve was. But how does Jesus respond? With Scripture. Thank you, Parker, with Scripture. There's your first clue. There's your first clue of how you maintain your authority and your right. When temptation hits, you fight with Scripture. I'm just so scared. No, no, no. When I feel that feeling of fear, I say, I do not have a spirit of fear. God did not give me a spirit of fear. I'm proclaiming Scripture. That's all Jesus did. Scripture says, I don't have a spirit of fear. Scripture says, God's perfect love cast out fear. That would be our version of handling that situation like Jesus did. But how many Christians do you hear do that? And how many Christians do you hear say, I'm just scared. I'm overwhelmed by fear. I'm so fearful I can't even get out of bed right now. Temptation number one was, Jesus, show me your power. And Jesus responded with Scripture. Don't try to lure me like you lured Adam and Eve. See, Jesus has come to reclaim what Adam gave up. And if we're going to reclaim what Adam gave up, Scripture's got to be an important tool for us. Verse 5, we'll go to the second temptation. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Did you pick up on the world? All. We've talked about this before. All the kingdoms. Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That's miraculous power right there. But it also shows that Satan has control of all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. So don't tell me the devil doesn't have authority over this earth. He just claimed it to the Son of God, and the Son of God did not argue with him. Because they are mine to give to anyone I please, I will give it all to you if you worship me. It went from show me your power temptation to, I'll give you all of this if you just worship me, Jesus. Verse 8, Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's almost like Jesus is showing us a simple blueprint of using scripture to defeat the enemy when he tries to take a right. Temptation number two, Satan steps up the game a bit, offers Jesus everything, all the kingdoms of the world, all authority. See, at this point, remember, Satan has gained the authority. When Satan says here, I have authority over these kingdoms, he uses that exousia word. He uses that word that says, I have the power and the right, because Adam and Eve had given him the power and the right. Adam gave him the power back in Genesis. Now he offers that power to Jesus. This is kind of confusing, though, because Jesus comes from heaven, and he's got the real authority over heaven and earth, right? 
So how can Satan offer him this partial authority over earth only? And I'm going to say something that I feel like God showed me, and I want to be very careful. When I feel like God has shown me something, I want to be careful to say, I feel like God has shown me this. Satan is trying to steal the rest of the authority that Jesus has. See, when he tempted Adam and Eve, they willingly gave up the authority. Now, Jesus comes with a new authority that includes heavenly authority, and Satan wants that authority too. And if he can just trick Jesus, see, Satan already has earthly authority. He's offering that as a trade for heavenly authority. Do you see that? Never heard that taught, and I just see it right there. But Jesus is a reversal of the first Adam. I ain't giving you the heavenly authority. You're not going to trick me. By the way, pal, I already have the earthly authority. I can take it from you anytime I want, and I do it a couple thousand years from now in Revelation. But Jesus has the real authority over heaven and earth. Satan offers partial authority because he's trying to steal the rest of the authority that Jesus has. Satan thinks humans are weak. Why is Jesus any different? He can trick him too, right? He's having to work a little harder. But Adam gave up worldly authority for the promise, a false promise at more authority. Now Satan offers Jesus back the earthly authority in hopes that Jesus will take it and give up to Satan his heavenly authority. So this proves that Satan has authority on earth. It proves that he still wants more. It proves that he still wants the authority from the Father in heaven that he thought he would get up in heaven that got him kicked out. And he tries to trick Jesus with something really good in order to destroy. Destroy Jesus and try to get something better. It's like the greatest chess match of all time. Like, can you step back and see this chess match between Jesus and Satan? But Jesus never argues about Satan's earthly authority. He never falls to the temptation. He just throws out more scripture. Jesus knew where his authority and his right came from, and he knew what all authority he had, and he used Scripture that's the same thing we have available to us to fight the temptation. But did Satan give up? No, he's not that simple. It's not that easy. Verse 9, Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off, for the Scriptures say. And I want you to point, think about something. He quotes Psalms 91. We give you Psalms 91 all the time as a protection scripture, and Satan quotes it verbatim to Jesus. He didn't twist it. Verse 10, for the scripture, this is Satan talking, for the scripture's say. Satan's going to join in on the game. You've been hitting me with scripture, I'm going to hit you back with scripture. For the scripture's say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Verse 12, Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, Satan, you must not test the Lord your God. This is interesting. (laughs) Satan has tempted Jesus twice. Jesus twice resists with Scripture. So then Satan says, all right, I'll match you and I'll give you Scripture back. He repeats Psalms 91 to Jesus. And he uses Scripture to tell Jesus to prove that Scripture is real. Scripture says, so go do it. Go do it, Jesus. Go do it. Test the Scripture. See if it's really real. He uses the Scripture to tempt Jesus. He doesn't change the Scripture. He just manipulates the purpose of the Scripture. The Scripture is a declaration of God's protection from evil, from Satan. And, you know, you've heard us say all the time, just because we have God's protection doesn't mean you go out and do something stupid. You don't literally go jump off a cliff because God can protect you. Jesus proved that right here. He didn't just go jump off the cliff to prove the Scripture. He didn't need to. He knew his authority. He knew his power. He knew his right. The Scripture is designed to be a declaration of God's protection from Satan's authority, and Satan tried to use that very Scripture to tempt Jesus. Evil people will use Scripture to manipulate us as Jesus' followers. It happens every day at churches all around the world. And Once again, Jesus responded with Scripture. Three temptations, 
three attempts to steal Jesus' authority, three failed attempts because Jesus gave Scripture to fight the temptation. So we're going to talk next time about a lot of practical things, but a common thing we're going to come back to is how well do you know Scripture to fight the enemy? I did everything I could a couple years ago to walk you through the whole Bible. Did you listen? Did you read it with me? Will you do it now that you understand that it's the, the key to your authority? Jacob, you go read Obadiah. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke for some other thing. We have to te- fight the temptation of Satan with Scripture. So whatever lie you're hearing from Satan, go find a Scripture to fight it. And if you don't know one, come ask us. I will help. I'll do my best to help you find a Scripture. And why this is a big moment is because this is essentially when this dual, this is hard to explain, but this dual worldly authority was established in this moment. It might rock your theology a little bit, and you may disagree with me, and that's okay. Many will say that Jesus took back authority from Satan when? When he died on the cross. Right? Death, burial, resurrection. I'm going to argue this is a little different. Satan gained the authority fair and square from Adam. Right? Jesus came, resisted the devil, maintained his heavenly and worldly authority. Then there's a day to come prophesied in Scripture, Revelation, and I'm about to read it to you in Luke, when Jesus takes back all of Satan's authority. Jesus did not take back all of Satan's authority when he died, when he was buried, and when he resurrected. That is false theology. He did not. He took away the sting of death. He took away the curse of the law. He did a lot of incredible things for our eternity, but he did not take away Satan's authority in that moment. I said the curse of the law. Yeah. But the kingdom of God stands today against the kingdom of Satan. There's still two kingdoms competing for authority on earth. And that's where we are until Jesus comes back and redeems, takes back, redeems when it says Jesus will redeem. It means to take back all of Satan's earned authority. Satan earned it. Luke 21, Jesus himself gives a prophecy that lines up with Revelation about his second coming when he will take back what Satan earned. In Luke 21, he's describing what's going to happen in the tribulation. In verse 28, he says, So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your redemption is near. Or this, my version I gave you says, Your salvation is near. But that word salvation, or sometimes translated redemption, is the Greek word that literally means to buy back. There's going to be a day in the future that Satan buys back. What did I say? I was testing you guys, and you all passed, and I failed, and I apologize. (laughs) Thank you for listening. I can see that clip going all over YouTube. There is going to be a day when Jesus buys back what Satan earned from Adam and Eve. He didn't steal it. He earned it. We've got to get the verbiage right to understand how we defeat it. Because Satan ain't going to steal it from us. He can earn it for us or we can fight him. James says, resist the devil and he will flee. What is that telling you? Resist him, and he has no right or power over you. He has to flee. We'll get into that more next time as well. Jesus is literally going to buy back, repurchase what was lost by Adam and Eve. So where does that leave us? Don't worry, this is long, but we're at the end. I don't get to preach for three weeks, so I going long today. Where does it leave us? We live in this gray world where Satan has power and right, authority, and Jesus has power and right, authority. And we have to choose daily, hourly, minutely, secondly, who we're going to give the right to rule us. It's our decision, and that's what we got to get our minds around. It is our decision who we give the right to rule us. 
And I really, really, really hate that this is our stopping point today. And I know that a lot of y'all are like, oh, thank God this is the stopping point. Especially Wendy, she's getting fidgety up here. Because I think the best part of this teaching is still to come. The, the, so far, it's just data, and I want to give you the hope part. But what I'm trying to help you do to understand today or help to get you to understand is what biblical authority is and who has it. And we live in this world of a dual kingdom right now, and it's confusing. But next time, we're going to dig deeper into Scripture, and I'm going to prove to you that you can do the same things as Jesus did, which is words out of his mouth. And he resisted the devil, and the devil fleed. That's power and right and authority. I'm going to prove to you that we can have that same authority. And I'm also going to prove to you that we often allow Satan the right and authority, the power over us. And I'm going to do it all with Scripture. So here's a key question. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger. Can you believe in Jesus, receive his salvation, live in eternity with him, but still give up your power and right to him every day? I'm sorry, to Satan every day. Can you be saved and spend eternal life in heaven with Jesus, but still give up your earthly rights to Satan every day? The answer is yes, you can. So this isn't a heaven and hell discussion, okay? But it does have eternal consequences. That's what we're going to get into next time. There are eternal consequences for how much right you give to Satan. We are promised rewards in heaven based on how we deal with these temptations. And we're going to dig into that. <laughs> Pete said, we're still toe shoes. <laughs> you think I'm going to be rough on you, Pete? It's going to be the hope sermon. We're going to prove that you can have the authority. We're going to prove that you can still be saved, go to heaven, while Satan has some authority over you, but why would you let him have authority over you if you know you have the right to take it back from him? Thank you, Parker. And that's our cliffhanger to the sequel, I guess, is where are we going next? You know, you watch a movie, and you get to the end, and it doesn't end. And they give you just one little scene for the next time. Think of a Marvel movie. It looks like it's at the end, but then you wait through the credits and they give you a scene to the next movie, and you're like, dang it, now I've got to wait a year for this. That's where I want you to be with this, because this is not a complete story. You cannot listen to this and think this is a complete sermon. We're going to talk about the power we can have through Jesus. We're going to talk about the things that we can do, our part, that determines who has power and right over us. And we're going to talk about how we handle this on earth has eternal consequences. That's your cliffhanger. You should worry, or not worry, you should wonder. You should want to know that. You should be expecting that. Because there's this hierarchy. We're going to submit to an authority. You're going to submit to either God or Satan. But you have promised authority when we submit to God's authority. It has eternal impacts for the new heaven and new earth. So here's my final two questions, three today. Don't you want to know what you deserve? Your parents die. They got millions of dollars. Don't you want to see the will and see how much you get? Why wouldn't it be like that with Jesus? Don't you want to know what you can have, though, before then? Don't you want to know what you can have today, tomorrow? But maybe we need to understand a different question. What are we willingly giving up that Satan's not stealing from us that we think he stole? Father, I pray that these words came out of my mouth correctly. I thank you for those that corrected me when they didn't because they have that authority. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the authority that you gave to us, that you give to us. I thank you for opening our eyes to see the authority. And Father, I pray that we will step into a new authority and take back from Satan what he has taken from us, what we might say he has stolen, but what we often give up to him. That we would understand our rights and that we would take it back because we are promised the authority that your son Jesus brought from heaven to earth. So Father, help us to want to know the rest of this story. 
We're just defining what power is, who has it, how it came about, but help us to yearn to know how we can gain it back, Father. Help us to be hungry for that over the next couple of weeks. Help us to go seek it out on our own without waiting. Help us to go learn Scripture in a way that we can stand strong against the devil so he will flee. And Father, I thank you for that promise that if we resist him, he will flee. Thank you for the authority you've given to us. Help us to take it back in Jesus' name. Amen. upon you and give you peace.